the New World Order. Chuck, it's good to have you here in the studio today. Well, John, it's nice to have you. Uh, when we uh, thought about doing this, I wanted one of the more outstanding uh, newscasters to join me to, to explore the topic. It's a subject of a lot of misinformation, uh, accusations flying left and right, all kinds of implied guilt by associations. There's, it's just time for us to hit this head on. Right. There's, there's the implication that anyone who believes in the New World Order believes in some kind of dark, cloaked conspiracy. Uh, this has been thrown very much at the, the Christian right, especially since of the recent political events, especially the uh, bombing in Oklahoma City and talks about militias and things of that nature. What is interesting is that the words New World Order didn't originate on the right. Uh, they've been in use since, I would say, virtually the turn of the century. And uh, this is interesting because they originated from the people who are proponents of uh, a global government or what they're now calling global governance. Uh, we find the word New World Order in, say, for example, the writings of Alice A. Bailey, which she channeled from the, the demon spirit, Joel Cole. And, and her writings uh, form the basis of much of what has been pumped into global education and other philosophies of the day. We find this term New World Order all the way down to the point where President George Bush quoted as well. And he popped out with the term New World Order, and everyone said, what does that mean? So I think that's what we're trying to hit today. What does it mean when we say New World Order? Yeah, exactly. And I think uh, most of us that have a, uh, a biblical perception also recognize that ultimately, in the final days, there will indeed be a time when the world will be under the thumb of a global dictator, etc. So, obviously, there's a tremendous biblical interest in the topic from people who take the Bible seriously on the one hand. At the same time, the term is really used, promoted, and so forth by people who are really, I would associate more with the left, certainly the pagan left. So it's a complicated area. And of course, since the Oklahoma bombing tragedy, it's being used, of course, uh, in all kinds of rhetoric aimed at uh, all kinds of groups. And I thought that's why I wanted you to join me, John, and explore this a little bit for our audience. All right. If we decide, I would say if we look at the New World Order, we're basically talking about a, a reshaping of how the nations of the world are going to relate to each other in the very near future. We're talking about politically, economically, whether they will remain nations or not, or whether they will be a, a global superstructure of government that controls all of this. And that's one of the things that, of course, is on the horizon. And this, of course, just begs the whole issue of what's happening on the global horizon, whether you're looking at Europe, United States, the Middle East, what have you, uh, Asia. It's clear that there's going to be a, an enormous... Uh, uh, restructuring as we approach the uh, end of the century. What do you foresee? Well, there's so many things. Uh, l let's start the discussion uh, right here at home because uh, this is where all the rhetoric is flying around. And at the same time, the United States, I personally uh, believe, is in very, very serious economic trouble. And I mention this because I do think most of the experts that I uh, respect highly do see a major, major upheaval of some kind occurring in the near horizon. Could be very, very close, a year or two, or it could be far out, maybe between five and ten years. But the point is, uh, there is a major, major time of reckoning, I think, destined upon the United States. One of the problems, of course, is that the experts are divided in terms of what it'll actually look like. Some feel it'll be hyperinflation. There's an easy uh, scenario there to suggest as the uh, Congress uh, fails to deal with some of our problems and money continues to inflate or its value thus deflating. There are many that believe the hyperinflation scenario, as characterized by Germany and Ar Argentina in, in uh, more recent times, may be the model. Others that I also... Uh, tend to lean toward, frankly, uh, believe it'll be uh, a deflation, an implosion. As we look at the United States debt, and by the way, I'll talk now not just about the federal debt, but about the total debt in the sense that the federal debt, the municipal debt, the corporate debt, the real estate debt, and the uh, consumer debt, those five major elements. In 1980, they added up to about $2.5 trillion dollars and they presently are at over $17 trillion. In other words, our total debt indebtedness in this country has increased by six and a half times in 15 years. If you start modeling that, you can quickly demonstrate that that debt will not be repaid. Our economy isn't capable of doing that. And so it's not only a federal problem, but the debt position of the United States is a major subject to all the thinking planners at a strategic level throughout the world, not just in this country. Is the debt going to, so to speak, drive this uh, deflationary collapse? 
uh, it's certainly a major indicator. And I focus on it as an example because you can get into a lot of little side details, but I tend to try to focus on the major fundamentals. And the indebtedness of our culture in the, here in the United States is a major problem, partly because it presently exceeds the value of all the real estate and all the corporate equities if you add it together. If you took all the real estate values at present prices of the entire 50 states, and if you took all the corporate equities listed on the exchanges, mm-hmm. that adds up to less than the total indebtedness. In other words, we're, as a culture, insolvent. We're living presently on our borrowing power, and our borrowing power is rapidly eroding. Right, and that exists mostly on smoke and mirrors anyway. Yes. I mean, and, just on confidence. And our future plans uh, uh, seem to be assuming that the European bankers were born yesterday. They're not. They're not stupid. And they recognize that the strategy of this country is to repay its debt with cheaper dollars. And they're not stupid. And that the, our, uh, the ability to borrow is going to increasingly become, uh, well, it's going to become more difficult. See, the federal government has a, a, a very, very difficult problem. Over the next 12 months, they've got to uh, borrow over a trillion dollars. Mm-hmm. And that comes about for a couple of reasons, not only because of the need to raise a billion dollars a day just to pay for the existing interest on the existing debt. Uh, the other problem is that the maturities of the notes that they've presently laid off is shortening. In other words, the federal government finds it necessary to increasingly use short-term notes rather than long-term notes, which means they've got to be rolled over more quickly. And so the the burden of the borrowing is becoming more and more intense. Many experts of the uh, foreign exchange markets feel that the federal government is facing increasing hurdles to try and lay off that, uh, you know, roll over that debt. So the point is, uh, this is all coming home to roost. Different. I'd never underestimate the ability of the experts to forestall the right. coming debacle right. at an at a increased penalty when it does hit. Having said that, the if you read the Wall Street Journal uh, or some of the other media, you would assume that it's business as usual, that we're not really coming up to any crisis in the future. Uh, that's, uh, of course, a typical Wall Street promotion to keep confidence. But incidentally, there's another side to this, too, not just to pick only on the federal government. Our trade deficit is also uh, a focus of serious attention. The trade deficit is a basically a measure of how much we're exporting versus importing, and we are importing vastly more than we export. In other words, we have a net trade deficit. That trade deficit is not only enormous, it's getting increasingly worse to the tune of between 150 to $200 billion a year. Uh, our ability to compete in the international markets is rapidly eroding. And so one of the problems we have is our international competitiveness at the industrial level, which, of course, drives many other things. So as one studies that whole picture, one can also recognize that the the possibility of it improving in the near term over the next few years is essentially unlikely. It's interesting that the Council for Competitiveness just recently uh, put out a report that one of the serious encumbrances we have is the uh, manifest failure of our educational system, that the graduates that of, our, our, of our schools, our public schools, are uh, becoming even worse than before, despite the billions being spent there, that uh, over 30% of the graduating seniors can't read, are, are functionally illiterate. And that's what's tragic, is that's 10% worse than it was two years ago, at, despite the increased expenditures. So the point is, these kinds of issues are not solved quickly. Even if we can turn that around, it's, going, it's, a, it's a long-term measure. So our ability to compete in the international market is really tough. We're burdened by debt at a time when both Europe and Asia are, are retooling our major, major, very successful competitors. This is one of the reasons that uh, I think that the fundamentals of the federal deficit, the fundamentals of our total debt in this country, the fundamentals of our trade deficit all add up to uh, real problems. What does this mean for the individual? Well, I think, for one thing, the individual needs to get informed. You know, one of the things that happens in America is that most people in this country are not really aware of the predicament that we're being plunged into. Uh, It's interesting, if you travel with any of the professional portfolio managers, people responsible for administering large sums, Mm -hmm. none of them rely at all on our domestic media. All of them rely, on the one hand, of international media, foreign publications, of course, and also the proprietary. There's some 800, 900 proprietary newsletters of specialized kinds that feed the portfolio management community. And so the first point to recognize the professionals are smart enough not to take seriously our domestic media. That's for public consumption. That's the domestic media. Yes, exactly. That's what I call the FPC product, for public <laughs> consumption. Exactly. It's, uh, it's biased. It's incompetent. And some people would argue with maybe some substance that it's very, very 
deliberately managed for special interests. But the main point is I think the number one task of you and I, John, mm-hmm. and others like us, is to first of all get, get sources of information that are competent and reliable to be able to develop a strategic perspective. I've always maintained. One of the things you learn in business is that the perspective is invaluable. If you, know, if you have a valid strategic perspective, you can always fill in the tactical details by asking the right questions. The real tough challenge is a strategic perspective, and that's one reason we publish our newsletters, to try to develop that. How is the, the U.S. doing militarily? Well, tragically, I think it's uh, really, on the one hand, we have a, uh, a well-trained, high-technology military. On the other hand, I think most of us perhaps probably have an overconfidence from the Persian Gulf War. What we fail to perceive is in the Persian Gulf, we had six months to position our equipment and handle the logistics. And then uh, secondly, we were fighting a country with the economy of Kentucky. And so on the one hand, it was a very, very dramatic Mm -hmm. episode. On the other hand, I think if you have the opportunity to talk to people at strategic levels, you can recognize that uh, in a coming confrontation, we could fare very, very badly. One of the things that really disturbed me is I had the opportunity to have an inside briefing at NATO headquarters Mm -hmm. in Brussels. Right. And I had an opportunity to discuss the situation with uh, Robin uh, Beard, who is uh, our ambassador to NATO. A correction, our uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense NATO, and also to Robert Hunter, our Ambassador to NATO. Both of them participated in inside discussion. And they pointed out to me that a nuclear confrontation in the Middle East is inevitable. Not just likely, but uh, inevitable. It's a question of timing. And so uh, one of the things that they also, uh, in response to my questions, I discovered something else that bothered me. When we faced the Soviet Union, we were well aware of the elaborate procedures they had in place to prevent a nuclear accident. They were very uh, very competent, but very, ruthless perhaps, but very competent, knowledgeable, rational adversary. Today, with the present confusion in Russia, it shocked me to learn that they don't even know who has the button. The confusion, the power grabs that are going on, uh, many of the experts are not even sure that Yeltsin is really running things. So the net of it is, we, we are in a position today that's more unstable than it's ever been. And at a time when our media would have us believe that it's peace in our time, there's no problem, right. and so forth. President Clinton has said several times, I've heard on several different occasions, that it's so wonderful that no longer are any warheads in the Soviet Union directed at targets in the United States. Which is, of course, absurd. If it were technically true, it takes uh, less than a few seconds to electronically retarget. Right. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an empty, that's empty rhetoric, typical of political uh, balderdash. What will I also understand that we do not have the infrastructure now? Say, for example, we had to tool up for a war, that we no longer have factories. They're going offshore. And so the infrastructure that would have to be in there, the know-how of how to do the the machinery work and things to construct war implements is no longer in place, nor can we put it in place over a short amount of time. Uh, That's exactly true. But also what what, what clouds even that analysis is the fact that present technology is such that it, it, everything has to be in place. You don't really have a mobilization period prior to a war anymore. As someone has recently quipped, uh, America, could, America could not survive the next Pearl Harbor. In other words, we need to be ready. Whatever is going to obtain uh, is going to have to be in hand. And uh, the next confrontation, uh, you got to realize that if you talk in nuclear terms, you're 30 minutes away. From, from a hit. So the point is, it's not, it's, there isn't a time to retool factories, there isn't time to do anything to an infrastructure. Being plunged into a world of the professional military armed with a, very, you know, with a specific technology in hand, and that will, the combination of training and that technology will determine the outcome long before anyone can respond in a logistic sense. Right, so, so in reality, we've entered uh, Chapter 3 of the Cold War rather than what the media have been saying, the Cold War is dead. And I guess I'm, couple, uh, I'm, I'm influenced by this because I had the privilege some time ago to sit on a board with Dr. Edward Teller, who was at the time the scientific advisor to the president, also with General David C. Jones, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who had then just retired, right. and also Admiral Tom Hayward, who was then uh, just retired as chief of naval operations. And as I got to know these guys in a project that we happened to be sharing, I was startled to discover that even though each of those guys has very, have very different personalities, you know, of course, uh, Dr. Teller was the classic Hungarian Renaissance man, scientist kind of guy. General Jones was a very formal organization man type of guy. And, of course, Tom Hayward was the youngest CNO in history. These three guys, although they're very different in their style and outlook on many things, shared one thing in common that startled me. They all lived at that their their careers in a personal fear of a preeminent strike by the Soviet Union, and I was startled by that, because I always regarded that as sort of a 
uh, strategic abstraction until they pointed out to me several things, one of which was that all the Soviet senior training doctrine for their top officers is built on the premise that they will enjoy the advantage of surprise that all their training and all their uh, their war games they play at the strategic levels all presumes that they will have the initiative and and uh, take their adversary by surprise. So the point is, uh, we're playing a real ball game here. Now, the Soviet Union obviously has been in shambles, but the Russian power struggles going on right now are uh, very real and very serious. And uh, so we're no longer facing a situation that is in control. And that's even more complicated by the fact they're no longer two players, not just us and them, so to speak. We now have 13 countries that have nuclear capability. We have 23 countries today that are presently building intercontinental ballistic missiles, and they're all mad at each other. And on top of that, uh, the estimate is that we have about 66 countries that have the capability to field a cruise missile. And so when you look at this, you realize that uh, the, the present strategic environment is one of uh, great instability and uh, so uh, Clinton's uh, confidence, I think, is strictly political rhetoric, and, and I don't think anyone that I know in the strategic circles takes any of that seriously. Yeah, before we knew what the rules were, now we're not too sure. We're on a floating ocean. Right on. You know, we talk about the New World Order, uh, and we need to get into this week the topic of is there a push for global governance and who are the people? But the, you mentioned war in the Mideast, our own military capability. Uh, does the New World Order crowd want a war? They don't want a war. In fact... What well, no one will really talk about. I mean, when they talk New World Order, they talk ecology, they talk overpopulation. They have all these different rationales. Mm -hmm. The real driving point that probably has some validity is this whole issue of nuclear proliferation. Because the real problem that we have in this world is that we have a, a uh, increasing hostility through many, many different ethnic groups and what have you. And the real problem is if, we, if our Department of Defense was ten times as big as it is today, who would you point it at? See, the real problem is that the nuclear confrontations can occur from all over, and uh, it, when you start analyzing this problem, you can begin to realize that the only secular answer is, to, is a global supervision of some kind, and that is really the unspoken but probably real motive under this drive towards global government. If there is war in the Mideast, how do we stand with that militarily? When you talk modern warfare, I don't think there are any winners. See, part of the problem is is that uh, the destructive capability of even relatively modest groups is staggering. I suppose Oklahoma is an example of how much destruction a very small group can provide. When you start talking ABC warfare, atomic biological chemical warfare, uh, suddenly you begin to realize that relatively modest resources in the hands of a, 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 a maverick, a renegade group of some kind can wreak major, major havoc. Uh, at the nuclear level, uh, I personally am very, very uncomfortable with the uh, submarine picture. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, we should talk about somewhere along the way is our strategic deterrent. Uh, the, the strategic deterrent, classically, of this country has been the uh, Trident, the Ohio-class Trident submarine, which carries, of course, the uh, Trident D-5, 5,000-mile range, uh, 10 independent warhead kind of capability. The Russian counterpart to this, of course, is the uh, Typhoon-class submarine, which has 20 tubes. Each tube has 10 independently targeted warheads. So each Typhoon-class submarine uh, can hold in hostage, in effect, 200 cities. And uh, these things are silent. They're hard, to f they're virtually impossible to find. They can operate from home waters. They've been designed to operate in the Arctic, where our sonar doesn't work anyway. Right. Our entire uh, anti-submarine warfare defense is based on passive sonar, because that has been the uh, adequate technology of the past. The Russians have had the opposite problem. They have been fa uh, facing a relatively silent enemy, so they've invested all their research and development in non-acoustic ASW, or anti-submarine warfare, and they've made some breakthroughs, we now know, and they've discovered that uh, uh, unusual lasers used the right way can track our tridents in real time, which suddenly creates a very disturbing imbalance. That means our tridents are compromisable should they need to be because they can tell where they are. We have no idea where the typhoons are. And at the same time, these things are capable of a, of a major strategic uh, blackmail situation. So this situation is very uh, is totally unaltered by the fact that the Soviet Union uh, has fallen to uh, the, the now, you know, the uh, CIS group, or call it Russia by its right, proper name. I think that uh, we are in a very, very strategically uh, exposed situation. And I think when uh, a confrontation occurs, uh, if in fact, let's just say there's something in the Middle East that Russia puts their muscle behind, mm -hmm. uh, suddenly we're in a situation of a standoff that's very, very uh, frightening, 
also the kind of standoff that can lend itself to miscalculation or misstep with gross, grave uh, global consequences. If we had to zoom back from, from that, because I know later in the week we'll be talking about the Mideast and Israel, the Golan Heights, uh, Israel's recent decision to rescind its annexation of more territory in Jerusalem. But what about internally? There's a lot of unrest in the United States right now, more than you would guess from the mainline media. And I think recent polls have shown that almost 50% of the people are uh, radically afraid of federal powers, which seem to be growing in incremental groups. Yeah, you know, it's interesting to see the onslaught of the media and the rhetoric go against the so-called uh, militias or these, the extremists. The truth of the matter is the man on the street, over half the population, uh, doesn't just distrust, they actually are afraid of the United States government. So I think that the disaffection, whether you, whether you attribute it to Waco or Ruby Creek, the Randy Weaver thing, or what have you, clearly there's a disaffection and a fear, and uh, it's a real fundamental of our life. Do you think this, and this is maybe the hard question, are we headed towards our own civil war? Uh, some people feel so. Uh, I, I, I would hate to think so. I think that a lot of misunderstanding, I think, in terms of the real posture of the bulk of these. I don't think, I think the people who are in militias and all of that are a minority of the disaffected. I think most people, the, I think the, uh, the most in- encouraging thing I've seen is the Christian coalition. I see that Ralph Reed has done, I think, an excellent job at getting a voice in Washington of what I'll call the rational right as opposed to the pagan left in the sense that aside from the uh, religious side of it, which is a key part of it, but the point is just simply getting uh, uh, some serious attention uh, to our uh, to their traditional American freedoms and, and constitutional protections. Right. If the if there will be first of all some re- reasonable investigations of the things that are bothering everybody, Vince Foster and all of that, and we can talk more about that later sure. this week. Some reasonable clearing of the air and some truth on that. If the if the media will turn about and stop this blackout and put on the line uh, the same information you get from any foreign paper, if the Americans can feel that we're finally getting disclosure of the fun and games that are going on, I think it'll do an enormous amount towards uh, uh, getting rid of this atmosphere of distrust and these these strange ideas that float around in the minds of the extreme uh, you know the extreme fringe yeah I think you're right about that what we have not had uh, all the issues the the Waco investigation that people have been clamoring for uh, in large measure uh, the Randy Weaver incident also things such as what we're calling uh, property forfeiture in the name of Uh, All sorts of things, environmentalism, whether it's in the war against drugs or any other forfeiture-related crimes. Americans are losing property rapidly in a large degree, and most of this goes unreported in the mainline media. This is what they're angry about. Yeah, the fact that's part of it. There's 52,000 Americans last year that had all their assets seized, and in 80% of the cases, there were no charges. No charges, right, much less convictions. Exactly, and and even those few cases where they had uh, other resources to pursue the clearing of their name when it was all over after two or three years, they still didn't get their assets back. It already been distributed to the informers, and, and the agency that uh, is involved gets to keep the assets. So it's a very, very unfortunate situation. Again, hopefully if the Congress will wake up, uh, uh, that can be uh, turned around. We talked a bit about uh, the history of the New World Order, the fact that the New World Order has been coined and used quite regularly by people such as H.G. Wells, Alice A. Bailey, uh, other people who have been in favor of some kind of global governance. We talked about United States economic problems, uh, where our military stands, which is not in very good shape at this stage of the game. And And uh, also we made brief mention of the fact that there seem to be, at least according to Robert Mueller, who is former Undersecretary General of the United Nations, three competitors now for some kind of global government. Uh, One of these is obviously the United Nations. The other, he says, is sort of an alliance of countries in Asia, possibly China, Japan, Singapore, countries like that. And the third candidate is the European Union. So why don't we look at the European Union today, the EU? I'd love to. Uh, as you know, John, I've had the privilege of traveling through Europe, uh, interviewing uh, 50 of the top leaders in Europe, traveling with uh, Bill Middendorf, who was the former Secretary of Navy. Uh, he's our ambassador to the European Union and uh, so forth. And so it was a great time. But it's interesting to get a feeling for the European viewpoints. Uh, they also have an attitude there of expectancy that ultimately uh, there will be a, a single administration of the planet Earth. I think uh, that's a very, very broadly held view among many. But it's interesting that in the United States, people who hold that view take for granted somehow 
that it'll be the United Nations. You can tell that right. George Bush hitched his right. wagon to the U.N. Uh, you see uh, evidence all over the place that uh, people seem to just take for granted that if, if there is going to be a world government, uh, it will emerge out of the United Nations. You know, we're being twisted into a lot of treaties, such as the U.N. Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, U.N. Convention on Civil and Political Rights, one treaty, because treaty law overrides our constitutional law and uh, forces law down onto the states. And that's frightening, of course, right. for many reasons. We can talk more about GATT and all of that. But on the European thing... It's interesting to me, it was uh, illuminating to me to discover that in Europe they have a different attitude. Uh, they sort of presume in, ver in varying ways that there will be ultimately a world government, but they don't uh, see the United Nations as the, uh, the heir to all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, they tend to look at the United Nations, first of all, with a very negative outlook. They uh, point very validly to its entire history. Everything, every single action the United Nations has taken on has been, in their view, a, a manifest failure. That's part one. Part two of their view is they tend to look at the United Nations as an American plaything, domiciled on American soil, funded by the Rockefellers, and yet with no real permanent funding mechanism. So they don't take it very seriously, frankly. Uh, there seems to different people have different views, but one of the things you keep running into is the Council of Europe. Don't confuse that with the Council of Ministers of the European Union, the mm -hmm. primary uh, uh, political body, in a sense. But rather, there's another group, also uh, co-located both in Brussels and in Strasbourg, and Luxembourg, actually, is the Council of Europe, which is a, a group of 32 nations. And they have undertaken a whole series of projects which have an unblemished record of success. Not large, ambitious things like the UN, but carefully considered and properly handled. So the point is, there seems to be a uh, foundation being laid in Europe. Uh, of, of their own agenda for a, an emergent uh, global entity of some kind downstream. I wouldn't see uh, visible evidence of this yet, but uh, I, I, uh, I see them looked at as a competing alternative to the United Nations. And frankly, from my own perspective, having uh, studied carefully Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, it's my personal view that uh, th that is more consistent with what I perceive as the biblical scenario anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're talking about a revived Roman Empire? Uh, yeah, the, the, the revived Roman Empire, of course, is a, a bookish term that commentators have used for many centuries. And when you express it that way, it sounds so quaint and strange. And yet, uh, in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, of course, we notice that there are four major empires laid out between the Babylonian Empire of Daniel's day and the ultimate end where God himself uh, steps in and takes charge. And there's four, not seven or three or some other number. The fourth one being in two phases. Phase one we've seen as the Roman Empire. Empire, phase two being a, a reemergence of that after it broke into pieces and will be a reassemble, according to Daniel 2. And that's exactly what we've seen on the planet Earth, the, all the elements of that empire falling apart in, a, in the 5th century, each part having had its day in the sun, so to speak. If we understand the scenario correctly, these pieces will come back together to emerge into a new entity, a revival of the original one. That's why I see the European view of an ultimate call it New World Order, being more biblically valid, if you will, than the uh, what I'll call the Bush or Clinton model. Right. Well, economically, does the EU have the clout? Oh, and how. Uh, one of the things, by the way, to put, let's step back a bit, uh, one needs to encounter what's called the heartland concept in history. Uh, the view that caused us when we were facing a two-front war, uh, your, uh, your Hitler in Europe on the one hand and Japan in the Pacific on the other, mm -hmm. we put our resources against Europe with a token force in the, in the Pacific until Europe was neutralized. Well, the reason we did that was because of an adherence to a classic global strategy, which is called the heartland concept. The view, if you do a geopolitical analysis of the planet Earth, the view is if anyone can consolidate the heartland of Europe, they'll have the resources to control the entire entity. And that view was ascribed to Hitler, and that's why we did what we did in World War II. It's interesting that that very heartland is the exact area that is emerging as this uh, European superstate. The United States has a population of, what, about 250 million? Mm -hmm. Europe, uh, European Union has about 350 million, but it's growing to over 450 million with the new adherents and, and others that are joining. So we're looking at a, a very well-resourced, highly trained, highly capitalized industrial uh, power. Uh, I had the privilege of being in the Ford Motor Company boardroom back in the middle 60s. Uh, when John, Sir John Andrews, uh, the Vice President of International, proposed that Ford recognize in its corporate plans the ultimate emergence of Europe on the planet Earth. And he, his recommendations were looked upon as, as 
insanity by most of the finance staff, but there were two guys in the room that didn't think so. One was my boss, R.J. Miller, who was the president of the company. The other guy was Henry Ford, whose name was on the building. And 30 days later, they formed Ford of Europe. And one reason the Ford Motor Company uh, is uh, doing as well as they are is because they have deep, deep roots, strong resources in Europe. In fact, when I left the Ford Motor Company at the end of 1968, uh, over half their assets had been transferred uh, outside the United States. So the point is, major multinational corporations have recognized this. It's coming like a glacier. Not smoothly. It has its problems. But most people in the United States do not understand the significance of what happened in October of 1993, Mm -hmm. the signing of the Masters Treaty. Mm -hmm. Most people in the United States haven't even heard of it. Named after a little town in the Netherlands where it was first drafted, it provides not for a confederation but for a single unified European super state. The United States of Europe, literally. Yeah, well, even more than that, a, right. a single, co- yeah, a common foreign policy, a common military, and ultimately a common currency. Right. And uh, this treaty has been signed by the original twelve, and there's uh, you know four others now that are, are joining, and the EFTA nations, all but Switzerland, have indicated their intention to join. So it's growing. Out of this combination, of course, if we understand the biblical scenario right, there will eventually be not only ten major players, but ultimately a dictator will take charge of it. It's been interesting to watch them try to match currencies uh, through the currency mechanism, what's called the exchange rate mechanism, the ERM. So uh, it it hasn't worked so far, but they're still goaling that before the end of the decade. And yet uh, the real power, of course, is the Bundesbank, the uh, German uh, muscle there. And there are obviously a lot of problems, and all, everybody's arguing about the date that it'll happen, 1997, some say after 2000. But the point is there is a drive to unify the European uh, Confederation. There are many problems they have to solve in the meantime, of course, but at the same time, it's coming like a glacier. If Europe is as strong as you say, we talked about the United States over the next five to ten years, maybe sooner, facing some kind of an economic implosion where we deflate down. Mm -hmm. Uh, Will we take Europe down with us, or will they stand independently? Oh, I think they're very independent. I think the policy of the United States has been, of course, to encourage the unification of Europe on the the theory that what we were doing is promoting a capitalistic, democratic trading partner. And what's really happening, uh, if we look at it more closely, is that we've uh, assisted a socialistic, centralist competitor Mm -hmm. that is very anti-American, and uh, it will grow to be more so. There's another dimension to this. I had an interesting luncheon when I was in Europe with Otto von Habsburg. Now, his father ruled Europe until 1918, the end of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and he's now a member of the European Parliament. But during the lunch, he made two remarks that uh, still echo in my ears. One of his remarks was he felt the ignorance in America is overwhelming. And that remark I did understand because I used to have an office in London. I was very familiar with how European executives in general tend to know far more about our local politics than even we do sometimes. You mean about American politics? American politics, right, yes, yes. Right. yes. And that they, uh, the, I was in California at the time, and they would know all about our gubernatorial races uh, and, and a lot of details that uh, we've been more informed than I was on many things. So I was familiar with the fact that the European in general is very aware of uh, global events, more so than the Americans who are more interested in what the last weekend's ball scores were and what have you. But the second remark he made really startled me. Audubon Huxberg also pointed out, he says, the concentration of power in America is frightening. And I didn't know what he meant. I'm, uh, I'm a guy that put plants in five countries. I've served on 12 public boards of uh, you know, public companies. I felt reasonably well informed. And yet I didn't really appreciate what he meant. And, t- and subsequently, when I got home, I started doing more research. And I frankly have to admit I was amazed because I didn't realize how concentrated the economic power in the United States is in relatively few hands. Uh, 20 years ago, we had 2,200 independent newspapers. And today, all the newspapers are owned by less than 50 families. Uh, as we watch the media, the, uh, the I'll call four networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, and of course CNN, you suddenly discover every night they run the same stories with the same slant. And you begin to realize that there are more, in 24 hours, there's more than those four or five stories. And it's amazing that there's no competitiveness there's no real quest for truth. It, it, it's a program media. Uh, those of you who have seen the Clinton Chronicles video, the most shocking interview on that video was Don Hewitt, executive producer of 60 Minutes, where he boasts that they withheld the truth from the American public in order to get Clinton through the New Hampshire primary. Sure they did. And right. what's amazing to me is that there is no apparent pursuit of truth by our major media. We've got this Vince Foster disaster in Washington, and no one is dealing with the facts. Right. There's um, there's more evidence there than there was originally with the original Whitewater, and yet the, the mainline media have refused 
to even deal with that issue. Yeah, here we have this most senior guy since JFK that was clearly murdered and moved there a uh, uh, day after the uh, head of the FBI was only fired but ushered out of his office. We have the FBI stacked with all kinds of, of, of strange maneuvering, and the media is silent about it. If you wanna, and yet, if you want to find out what's going on, you can pick up any of the reputable European press, and they're, they're on it every day. And uh, it's not as if there's any secret. The facts are shocking, and they're available, and yet our media... Uh, it won't touch any of this with a 10-foot pole. It's the same thing whether you're talking about Ruby Creek, Randy Weaver, or whether you're talking about the Waco situation. You can just make a list of things that somehow, for whatever reason, is just not politically correct to get into, and our media is silent. The American people are being denied the advantage of some diversity of opinion. Chris, what's interesting, at the same time that you say that, and I agree with it, is the fact that now all sorts of alternative sources, talk shows, uh, newsletters, fax trees, email trees, phone trees, are springing up, and the mainline media are, first of all, trying to debunk those alternate sources because they're exposing what the mainline media are not covering. And when we talk about mainline media, just so people understand out there, I'm talking about uh, the wire services and the major syndicates whose articles are republished in local newspapers. In other words, these are literally lifted off the wire, shoved into a newspaper, relatively little editing. All right. But now you have alternate sources, such as even this program. And uh, this is creating an interesting competition here. Yeah, this is uh, one of the reasons, John, I was glad that you agreed to join us in, in these series of special broadcasts because your, your own program is one of the uh, breaths of fresh air. The good news in America is that talk radio, uh, uh, and there's many examples of really competent ones, yours being one of them, uh, that are, are end-running this, um, what I call almost a monopoly on the American mind. Right. Um, the uh, Internet is another exciting thing because we're discovering that between Internet, email, faxes, uh, talk radio, and also the proprietary newsletters, there's hundreds of them around the world, are the means by which the real professionals are staying informed as to what's going on. So the, that's the bright spot in this picture. But the average American uh, doesn't realize uh, how much he is uh, spoon-fed, managed, uh, kept in the dark, kept distracted with, uh, you, you know, you can make the list. Uh, yeah. With O.J. O. J. Simpson, Simpson trial, right. Yeah, Harding, whatever, you know. There's always something that sort of captures everyone's imagination that has no strategic relevance at all. At the same time, uh, the really strategic things that impact your life and mine are uh, not, re- not reported. They're withheld, buried, or ridiculed. Right. The ridicule seems to be the, the effort nowadays, as I see it, to, uh, to, to offset that. We've been talking about Europe. What about their military strength? Are they going to grow as a power? Well, that's, you know, that's fascinating to me because I can remember when I was with Ford, I had a mission to try to put together some of the things. going. We had about 60,000 employees in the Dunton, England, and we had about 40,000 in Ford of Cologne, uh, in Cologne, Germany. And I used to have chair meetings of the engineers from Ford of Germany and Ford of Britain. And uh, in the same room, the guys on the left side of the table used to fly their spitfires against the guys at the right side of the table's Messerschmitts. I mean, these guys were face-to-face during the war. Back, you know, This was the mid-'60s when I was there. Mm-hmm. But the point is, uh, I can remember all that so vividly, those tensions were still there. What amazes me is we see France and Germany beginning to pool their military. And I thought I'd never live to see the day that would happen. And I sometimes quip, you know, have the you know, history books? I mean, it's amazing. Uh, you find that uh, France, Italy, and Germany are pooling a budget for the new naval frigates that are being built to their spec, advanced high-technology type ships for the European Navy. Uh, you begin to see these things start to, to happen. You begin to see that the, uh, the, the pooling of the resources is, you know, significant. Europe was very, very anti-ballistic missile defense. But now we see France and Italy joining their economy together to put up an anti-missile defense, protecting themselves from, guess what, from the Middle East, because they realize that there's a growing nuclear missile capability in the Middle East, and they're nervous about Europe. So they're now suddenly very uh, pro-ballistic missile defense. But again, it's interesting to see them pulling together and uh, joining. You see, you realize, of course, that the atomic energy uh, efforts were already pooled with the treaties of Rome that were signed in uh, March of 1957 the European Atomic Energy Community. The European Economic Community wasn't the only community formed by that treaty. The European Atomic Energy Community was also formed, Euratom, as they call it. So they've been pooling their nuclear capabilities for some time. The military prowess in uh, Europe is substantial. I participated in a Department of Defense study in which they tried to, we tried to assess specific technologies in different countries. And it may shock you to discover that there are many technologies in various small countries that we don't have in the United States. Uh, in those days, the big issue was armor, anti-armor, and uh, we were, I was shocked to discover that we in those days, this would have been, oh, uh, less than 10 years ago, did not have the capability to penetrate the Soviet armor, the reactive armor. Fortunately, Israel and West Germany could, so you can mm-hmm. horse trade. 
Uh, there are some t- technologies that Italy had that no other country did. There are technologies that France had, uh, Germany had, that, you know, that, that we didn't have. And, and the good news is that we were able to horse trade that. But the point is, it's also interesting if you watch the defense press, how often we purchase armament from European suppliers. There's various missiles and other things that we purchase from European suppliers. Does Europe have a military infrastructure unlike what we have? Yesterday we were talking about the fact that the U.S., if we were to hit a war situation, would be unable to tool up for it at any reasonable time in the future. Well, tooling up's one thing, and that's, of course, a problem I think we've talked about. But the other side of it is, you, you, in, in, in the kind of wars that were, that were trembling before, there won't be time for mobilization. They really become a war of logistics. Our ability to sustain another Persian Gulf kind of engagement is not likely to give us six months' advance notice to position our equipment. The uh, potential military threats that we face, uh, especially if we're not facing a, you know, a, a, uh, a partner, as we did before. See, bear in mind, we had Turkey as a partner there that led us air bases. Uh, we had, uh, you know, Muslim countries that were in various ways at least partially supportive. Uh, you take away those kinds of things, and we're facing some real, real tough to- tough problems logistically, not, not just mobilization, but logistically from here. So, no, I think, I think our military uh, pride uh, is misplaced. I think we need to recognize that the... Uh, you're living in past glory is what you're past doing. Past glory, and right. I think the, the turbulence that's forthcoming that seems almost a certainty on the horizon, is one that uh, is going to be very challenging. If we had to look at Europe, uh, do we need to jump from Europe, Chuck, to something else, or have we wrapped well, on that? Well, we could always. We have, in fact, a lot on Europe. We even published briefing packages on Europe that we call iron mixed with clay. But I think something else that we touched upon, as we look at Europe, part of the problem is the United States' competitiveness industrial competitiveness. We've talked about the trade deficit. And one dimension of this that's often overlooked is the predicament we have in our educational facilities. The uh, Council for Competitiveness recently, just a a few weeks ago, published a report which points out that one of the biggest problems American industry faces is the uh, tragic output of the public schools, that over 30 percent are functionally illiterate, etc. And I mention that because not only is it a serious problem in many ways, but it's the kind of thing you're not going to fix quickly. Uh, even if we start doing the right things in our educational facility, you're talking a generation cycle here. So the ability of our in- industry to really be more competitive, and we our trade deficit mm-hmm. measures uh, painfully just how... Uh, non-competitive we are, $150 billion a year growing, getting worse. Most people, I think, uh, uh, may not be aware of just how bad our educational system is. And that things such as Goals 2000 are not going to correct it. They will continue to slide down. They'll make it worse. In fact, right. that's really their goal, which is another whole <laughs> expose. To right, get you can do a whole show on it. The important thing to recognize that the ultimate goal of Goals 2000, this was enabled by pieces of legislation such as H.R. 6, uh, the Elementary and Secondary Reauthorization Act, and Goals 2000 came through, a, I believe, a separate piece of legislation, uh, is ultimately womb-to-tomb control of education. Uh, we're talking about the Parents as Teachers program. Uh, literally, uh, social workers will be assigned to blocks of cities and towns, and they'll police that, and they'll uh, teach neighbors how to spy on their neighbors and see whether or not they're abusing their children. Now, of course, abuse doesn't mean physically abusing or hurting. It will have a wide definition of abuse. Uh, social workers will go into the hospitals and uh, right when a child is born, and they, the government will become involved in the raising of the people. On the flip side of that, what will be required in the future is a certificate of initial mastery. Uh, without the CIM from one of the schools, assuming that you have the correct, politically correct attitudes, if you don't, you don't get the CIM, you won't even be able to get a job. And if you move from one job to the other, uh, even if you're out of school, you'll have to get certified at the CIM just to get the job. These are This, this is not theory. This is really on the books. This is where we're going with this. This is why it's very pernicious. But there's a good si- there's a good news to that, by the way. Just a few weeks ago, we had a very, very exciting decision handed down by Judge Rehnquist writing the majority opinion on a 5-4 to four vote by the Supreme Court. And for Alfonso Lopez, a 12th grader in Texas, was arrested for having a, uh, a, carrying a gun to school. Mm-hmm. And he was arrested under Texas law. The feds stepped in. The Texas charges were dropped. The feds indicted him and convicted him. Uh, on the federal laws relative to school. He appealed, uh, went all the way to the Supreme Court, and in a delightful decision, he was, uh, they, they agreed with him. That, uh, the fe- and they wrote an extensive opinion, 
uh, it, it, the the text, by the way, is praised for us in our June newsletter. But the 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 point is, the Supreme Court ruled that the rights of the federal government are specific and enumerated. The rights of the states are unspecific and not numerable, and that the control of the schools uh, by the federal government is unconstitutional. And the language of the decision is broadly drawn, is very exciting in my view, and uh, it is probably the most important decision for the American public in the last 60 years. Hopefully, it's a breath of fresh air. It's a return, hopefully, to constitutional boundaries, constitutional protections. And so it's too, it's too early to get too optimistic. On the other hand, we'd be, our reporting would be incomplete by not mentioning the fact that there is at least uh, a breath of fresh air brewing on the school side. Another scenario in the Mideast is also, uh, well, it is the Mideast, isn't it? But <laughs> no, one, no, no. I was going to work into that one more, <laughs> right. except for the fact that it's more like uh, Israel. And uh, Israel's uh, at least planned destruction on the part of a number of countries there. Yes, exactly. Uh, the uh, All kinds of countries that don't get along with each other all have the common objective of trying to annihilate Israel. You know, you can talk about uh, whether you're talking about uh, Iran or Syria, Iraq, Libya, Egypt, Turkey. You can mention these. You haven't talked about an Arab yet, but they do have one. These are all different. Some are sons of Ham, some Shem, some Japheth. But they do have one thing in common, and that is their Muslim background, a commitment to the destruction of Israel. So right. Israel is a key part of the global scene. Interestingly enough, that's exactly what Zechariah predicted in Zechariah chapter 12. It predicted every that the entire world would be burdened. Uh, with the city of Jerusalem. And that's strange because Jerusalem has no harbor, no natural resources, and yet indeed today, late lights burn in every nation's capital trying to figure out what to do about the problem of Jerusalem. So as we talk about the global scene, as we watch the world struggle for uh, what they call the New World Order, presumably a move towards some kind of unified global administration, one of the uh, elements in this struggle is uh, the whole issue of Jerusalem. I sometimes call the uh, period in which we live the decade of deceit. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that uh, Israel Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin uh, made the following promises before and immediately after his election. Uh, He said that he'd never negotiate with the PLO. And yet within 30 days, he began secret talks. Uh, Of course, for doing that, he's incredibly unpopular uh, in Israel. And and, and future elections may bring in the Likud party in the very near future. Well, that's exactly where I'm headed, because he said he'd never allow a Palestinian Palestinian state, and yet he's already obviously uh, moved uh, strongly that way. He said he'd protect the 136,000 Jewish residents of the settlements in Judea and Samaria and Gaza and so forth, Mm -hmm. and not uproot them. And yet he's already instituted a housing freeze right away when he took office, that is, and he cut off all government funding and so on. He said he'd never surrender the Golan Heights, a specific campaign promise. And, of course, you realize where we are today, where that's put on the table. So this is all heading to, of course, is a major explosion in Israel. There's a a high likelihood that the Likud party is going to take over, and you've got a reaction in the population against the existing leadership, so much so that there's even talk of assassination attempts and so forth from the Jewish extremists. And so um, the net of it is, is that there's a huge, huge instability. But one of the things that discouraged us in our recent visit to uh, Israel is uh, almost a sense of resignation on the part of many of the traditional leaders, the people who are the vigorous uh, uh, leadership on behalf of the independent state, are on the sidelines resigned. Uh, the fix seems to be in. There's, there's the same, uh, we sense the same atmospheres of resignation there as we did when we visited, we swept through Europe on the Maastricht issue and discovered that in each country, where each of the 12 countries are Maastricht was signed in Europe, it was done by subterfuge and fun and games and, and right. uh, so forth. Yeah, some and countries didn't even like when Norway refused to go in. Uh, that was really a surprise. <laughs> yeah, well, and, yeah, exactly. And that was, they weren't in there on the original Maastricht, but yeah, they had and, a, a yeah. referendum vote recently. Right, and then and Denmark you know, voted against it, but then the government using public funds kept right. hammering away until they did. Right. And the National Assembly in France was against it, but then by dealing and fun and games, they slipped it through. Uh, I had lunch with Prince L- uh, Niklaus of uh, Liechtenstein, and he dismissed his parliament in order to get it through. John Majors preached against it until it came from a vote and then pledges premiership to slip it through. You sense, not just in the United States, but in abroad too, that there's a hidden agenda, it would seem. In Israel, too, we sense that. Here's uh, uh, Rabin and his gang uh, apparently just selling out the country. The country just in arms, uh, really upset. Uh, we're, we're facing major instability there. And as, as uh, I mentioned in our NATO briefing, um, there's an expectation on, on the strategic councils all over the world that there's going to be a nuclear confrontation. 
over all of this before the smoke clears. So, in the not too near distant yeah, future. Exactly. Or not too exactly. far distant future. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Right. So the whole Middle East situation is one that um, I think is, again, uh, part of the equation that uh, in Europe, in the U.S., and, and in Asia. Something else that's interesting, recognize that Asia is making deep investments in the Middle East, too. China and Japan both being major uh, uh, shipping major arms and what have you uh, to the Middle East. So this ho- the whole world interdependency is part of the the reason there's this widespread presumption on the part of uh, the leadership, uh, especially the socialist leadership, that there's going to be a destiny of a, of, a, of global government. Is there resignation on the part of people? I mean, like in this country here, people really seem to think things are out of control, out of their control anyway. Well, it manifests itself in many ways, of course. Uh, some people are sort of have a head in the sand on the sidelines kind of issue, and that's something that alarms me uh, probably the most. Mm-hmm. But, of course, the other manifestation we see in this country is the militias and uh, things of that kind because uh, uh, we see that in the press so much, uh, this whole idea that there are groups getting together and bearing arms under the Second Amendment uh, uh, so forth. It's interesting to see the government and the media jump on this to paint them as extremists and also to take to, to try to create an equivalence between the militant extremists and uh, the militias. And I think that I tend to look at the militias more as a symptom rather than a real faction, but I think it's a, a, a symptom of uh, uh, disaffection that's much more widespread than just the militia movement. Yeah, the, the actual level of discontent is not being relayed in the media. As a matter of fact, for so long, many of these... The things that are making people angry, especially in the West, uh, went unreported in the media and have even been ridiculed of late. Fortunately, there is some some dialogue on it, but it's interesting to note that a Gallup poll had about um, 50% of the people in the country that they sampled afraid of the federal government and its power and its intrusion to their lives. That's a, a real revealing statistic. USA Today choked on the first poll. They did two of them you know, to, to see. And uh, it was amazing that they did not believe that that was a level was that, which shows you that those papers, as we've said before, are part of the Eastern establishment. They're in their own world. They don't reflect the culture of what's going on further out in the country. And it also shows that the militia movement itself, whatever it is, uh, be that as it may, is, is but a symptom of a much, much broader concern, a concern for constitutional protections that we've taken for granted that seem to be challenged by the flagrant disregard of the Constitution by the present administration and the, uh, the surprising silence of the Congress of not being more jealous of its prerogatives over the executive. Uh, There was a day not long ago when the Congress was so jealous of its prerogatives it created all kinds of problems in this country. And today we have an administration that runs roughshod over the Constitution and uh, the Senate and the Congress uh, sit by idly almost as if they're part of the the, the problem. So I think that's one reason the American public is uh, so disaffected. I think the other thing that needs to be said that's part of the equation is the American public's growing awareness that they're being hoodwinked, that they're not being told the truth by the government or by the media. And I think the, uh, the real problem at Waco, in addition to the tragedy of Waco, is the, the, the growing awareness that uh, there's been uh, cover-ups involved. Uh, the whole Randy Weaver, Ruby Creek event is uh, uh, not just an Idaho issue. It's something that's getting uh, more and more attention. But probably, um, in addition to all the some 30-odd scandals that seem to surround Little Rock, uh, the one that I guess is perhaps uh, most visible in many people's mind is the whole Vince Foster thing. And the fact that now they're discovering that he made all, he made a, a large number of trips to Switzerland that even his wife didn't know about, that he apparently was on all kinds of errands, possibly for the intelligence community. We find the FBI, not, uh, head of the FBI, not only fired, but summoned out of his office the day before he's uh, killed. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fact that it occurred apparently across the street from the Saudi Arabian embassy, who knows what that has all about. The the point is, it's, not, it's clearly uh, that he his body was moved. It was not a suicide. There's uh, all kinds of law enforcement uh, evidence to that effect, and yet it's being ignored uh, by the press, first of all. You'd think that this would be rich material uh, for visibility. In the old days, there was a competition for stories, and today there's almost a blackout. And the, here we have a flagrant cover-up, and the, the mystery of the cover-up is bigger than the mystery of the, uh, the death itself. So, so Vince Foster may have been killed for money or for an affair or who knows. What's the mystery isn't the murders. Why does it merit such uh, extreme cover-up, by, both by the administration and by the press? Uh, that's, that's what's gnawing at the gut of every American. Yeah. And then we find out uh, it's still obviously way too early to draw any conclusions about Oklahoma. 
But more and more that is learned, the more mysterious it becomes, people are beginning to get at least the impression that there's skullduggery going on there. I think one of the problems we have in this country, uh, aside from the substance of each of these issues, is that the overall impression the American public has is that they're not being served by the media, they're not being told the truth, and that's causing not only a disaffection in terms of distrust of the government, but a fear of violence from the government itself. Uh, the good news, so we don't sound too negative, the good news is that between talk radio, uh, and that's one reason uh, uh, we invited you to join us on this uh, special broadcast, John, because your program, your regular program, is one of the bright spots in America. Thank and you. I think there are, are talk shows uh, of a similar caliber that are changing the complexion of the country. And I think that between Internet, fax machines, uh, pr- private proprietary newsletters, there's some 800 professional newsletters in various specialized fields, primarily for investment or people that follow specialized markets. And these are typically published by people who own the publication, who take no advertising, whose only claim to fame and survival is their ability to try to be uh, credible, valid, and and truthful. The exciting thing is there are uh, emergent alternatives to the uh, uh, retail consumer public uh, publications that are really blinding America, not only not publishing the truth, but distracting America with trivia of various kinds, rather than focus on the things that threaten our our opportunities, our freedoms, the the country we hold so dear. Which explains to a large degree a lot of the effort to discredit talk shows. In other words, within two days of the bombing at Oklahoma City, uh, the first of all was to paint this as a right-wing extremist event, and then the paintbrush was brought back over everybody on the right, whether you're a conservative or a homeschooler, uh, anybody who believes that maybe there's a move towards global governance is a kook and an extremist. This was the way the thing was painted. And that was not what was called for. What was called for was national healing at the time. Because talk radio, after the bombing, literally held its breath and did very little until President Clinton two days later came out with this really wild assault. And by the following Monday, of course, talk radio had to respond at that point. Yeah, the whole the whole onslaught against the would-be extremists, setting aside whatever the Oklahoma City uh, uh, event really was caused by and for, et cetera, setting that aside for the moment, what was amazing is the highly organized uh, exploitation of the event by the liberal left, the pagan left, trying to create an identity between militias, extremists, Christians, what have you, was I think the good news is it's backfiring on them. We're finding all kinds of rumbles. It's going to be very, very exciting if the real truth can come out because we understand foreign newspapers very early carried articles that there was a second vehicle involved, that uh, one of them uh, that was uh, involved Middle Eastern men that was left parked at DFW Airport. We understand that some of the initial interviews indicated that the the uh, fertilizer was sold in 80-pound bags to three Middle Eastern men. I don't know how valid these things are. They seem to have been hushed up, which means either they were not valid or there's some kind of cover-up going on. We understand that the FBI was warned from the Middle East of the event before it happened, not specific location. We understand that there were as many as three bombs involved. I think one of those was simply a, a weapon that fell off a, a bench. I mean, it's not clear there were three independent bombs. Mm-hmm. There were two, at least, but apparently at least two. Apparently, it's interesting that within hours of the blast, Tehran claims that this was entirely an internal American problem. But it's interesting that the Middle East is so quick in denial. <laughs> uh, it, the, the, the whole point is it's not clear yet uh, exactly what that was all about. There seems to be some real anomalies here that a penniless guy was able to fund over $100,000 of uh, special technology to blow up the building. And uh, several people that were interviewed on national television recently, by the way, uh, said on the one hand to the announcer, I'm not supposed to ask, I'm not supposed to talk about this, but I sure want to know. This is the, the lady that lost the two babies, uh, said, uh, I'd you like to know why there were no ATF people on the, why, on the government floors. Uh, when the bomb went off. Yeah, not uh, to mention rumors that are running around that a number of uh, federal people working in the building said the day before people were saying, don't come in on the 19th. I mean, these are all things that are uh, more and more beginning to emerge, not just as rumors, but as things you could substantiate. Uh, also, former Brigadier General Benton Parton uh, has come out and said, in his background, is in divine, uh, designing various explosives and things of that nature for use in military combat, especially uh, warheads, things of that nature, and determining their effectiveness. And he is saying that a fertilizer bomb just does not have the concussive power required to bring down a building. It would have blown off the front of the building. But he said you needed direct planted charges to knock out those pillars. He said especially since some of the pillars further away from the blast came down, while ones closer in stayed up. 
And he's saying that's just not the way it works. So tremendous number of questions, but right now it's been cast as if one or two people uh, did this all by themselves. And it bothers me. It's too clean. Well, that's a traditional American myth. You know, it was always a lone gunman that killed Lincoln. It was a, a lone assassin that killed J.F. Kennedy. The, you know, the, 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 the crazed single man acting alone is the comfortable American myth that we use to uh, hide our awareness of a coup d'etat actually taking place or what have you. And it's strange that if you look, uh, the Europeans have a different attitude because they remember the Reichstag fire when uh, uh, Hitler, in order to gain power... Uh, well, what they did is they took a... The, if you remember, there was a, a communist by the name of Marius von der Lubbe, Okay, And the guy was somewhat half-deranged. But they, the uh, Goering convinced him that he needed to burn the Reichstag. Uh, and so this idiot went in there. And literally, idiot. The guy was not very mentally stable. And the Reichstag went up. <laughs> Kaboom! Uh, it didn't blow up. It went up. There were literally 20 bundles of incendiary material found inside the Reichstag. When they finally got the flames out, first of all, they found this this half-naked Dutchman running around inside, and they arrested him, and uh, they they led a tour of the press through the Reichstag. And what happened is they found, first of all, 20 large bundles of material. This guy couldn't have done it himself. And the trail leading to this went back through the passages that led to Goering's office. Remember, he was part of the Reichstag at the time. So the world press at the time just said, wait a minute, this is not one guy. But nevertheless, Hitler went to President von Hindenburg the next day. And he said to him, look, the communists are about to take over the country. Uh, we have a national emergency. You've got to give me all these powers. And von Hindenburg finally came out with what would be the equivalent of an executive order. And it was called, I even remember the title in German, Die Verordnung zum Schutz von Volk und Re uh, vom Reichenstaat. Okay? And basically the ordinance of the Reich's president for the defense of people and state. And it literally abolished what would be our Bill of Rights. It abolished the right to freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. Uh, they legalized wiretaps and searching of, uh, searching of your postal uh, property, you know, mail, things of that nature. Also, uh, search and seizure of houses without warrant. Uh, and starting from that point, that was the event that uh, basically turned the Third Reich into what the Third Reich was. It was a legal event. That's what everybody needs to understand. And it was all on the pretext that this one guy, Marius von der Lubbe, had done it. He was, by the way, tried and convicted based on a retroactive law and beheaded. And that was that. But it was all pretext. You know, it was very clear that the Nazis put this guy up to do it. And it's interesting that uh, people, there are people in this country that can believe that they draw analogies between that and the Oklahoma City event. Now, I'm not implying that uh, there is a valid analogy, but it's, first of all, just symptomatic that the people in this country can uh, uh, distrust their government that much to uh, consider that as a possible uh, 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 scenario. scenario. And, and on the one hand. On the other hand, it's also disturbing to see how quickly setting aside whoever really did it and for whatever reason, how quickly the administration and the media jumped on the event to exploit their agenda against right. the Christian right. Well, we had something happen in the state of Colorado, which is where I originated my, my show from. Uh, state Senator Charles Duke, who uh, spearheaded the sovereignty resolution passed in so many state legislatures last year, was at a gun rights rally within a week of the bombing in Oklahoma City. Uh, he got up, and this was at the state, state capitol, he got up and he said, uh, how many people believe that this was the work of Timothy McVeigh or whatever, nobody. How many people believe that the government did this? And virtually everybody's hand went up. He was crucified in the local papers. How dare he ask this? It was outrageous that he asked this question. Blah, blah, blah. How stupid he was. What a jerk he is. How irresponsible he is. Not one single focus on the fact that everybody raised their hand in affirmation that they felt the government. Talk about distorted reporting. All he did was ask the question. That's what he said. He said, I just wanted to see what the mood of the people was, so I had to ask the hard questions. And the paper crucified him. They weren't at all concerned that everybody agreed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the situation we're at right now. You know, we talk about this uh, uh, one world order thing. Uh, in the United States, you know, there's other, other dimensions of this that need to be uh, sort of... Uh, brought out on the table, too. You know, the whole issue of NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, it's very, very interesting that uh, that whole thing was promoted through subterfuge and what have you, mm -hmm. even to the extent of labeling it an agreement. Now, those of you that are on Internet know you can dial into the White House and get their different agendas and so forth. It's interesting that up until the day it was approved, it was called an agreement, so it would qualify for only 51 percent approval by the Senate, and it barely passed. But the minute it was passed, the next day on the Internet, you could see it listed under, guess what, treaties. 
And treaties are, in the Constitution, if you may recall, they require a two-thirds majority of the Senate. So the first thing that disturbs you, quite apart from its content and implications, is the subterfuge that is being allowed to bring these things into law. They're just frauds, frankly. They're a fraud against the American people. They're a circumvention of this Constitution. Now, the NAFTA agreement, of course, is a a major disaster for many, many reasons. And incidentally, it may interest you to know that the three, three of the most disparaged currencies on the planet Earth happen to be the Mexican peso, the Canadian and American dollars. And so we have strange bedfellows. But the thing that we should recognize as you stand back at a strategic level is to recognize that these regional trade agreements that are intended to supersede in some measure the sovereignty of the members are a step, a deliberately planned step towards eventual globalism. Mm -hmm. The strategy being to create these regional trading blocks, enlarge them, interconnect them, first of all, as a mechanic towards the perceived end, perceived by many, the the socialist agenda especially, uh, an an end of having uh, eventually a totally uh, interlocked, centrally run uh, economy for the entire planet Earth. Now, it's interesting that NAFTA is, they're trying to extend it to Chile. I haven't figured out how they got Chile into the North American uh, hemisphere. (laughs) The the reason they have Chile in there is because it's the most booming economy on the the South American continent. And if Chile has any brains, they'd stay out of it because it can only drag them. Chile's doing very, very well in many, many ways. And so uh, Argentina and some of the others are starting to really do well, too, by privatizing their welfare programs, by uh, providing laws to protect property, by taking maneuvers to protect protect their currency, uh, doing all the things that encourage investment, encourage prosperity, which then in turn starts to solve all the other problems. Something that we uh, founded this country on, experienced its prosperity, but somehow forgotten the dynamics which made us strong. But in any case, that's the NAFTA agreement. Now, what also disturbs me as you watch this and try to sense what's going on, we come, of course, you can't resist getting into this whole issue of GATT, the General Agreements of Tariff and Trade. And what's disturbing about GATT, quite a Apart from its trade relationships and all of that, is that in the 22,000-page document, buried in it, almost hidden in it, is the provision for the World Trade Organization, an organization that provides no practical means of withdrawal, that supersedes the laws, the trading laws of the member states, etc. Now, what's disturbing about this, it's a direct erosion of U.S. sovereignty, but the real problem, in my mind, to try to understand what's really happening here is that it was forced through a lame duck Congress without debate. Now, you would have thought that with the November elections and the landslide expression on the American people for a change, that the uh, the Newt Gingriches and the Bob Doles and so forth would have at least gone through the motions of debate. But rather, one of the things that disturbs me about the uh, the, the the Washington scene is that Bob Dole and Newt Gingrich took the leadership to ramrod get, despite its controversy, right. uh, through the, uh, a lame duck Congress, there was plenty of time. If they wanted it through, it would have been easily, they didn't need to get it through, I don't think, until the following summer, till, in fact, June, this month coming up. But the point is, their ramrodding it through without debate causes, I think, many of us to be extremely cynical about just how much change is really going on in Washington, despite the uh, the change of political party. I, I tend to feel that, well, let me put it this way, I think most Americans begin to suspect there's just as much corruption and hidden agendas on both sides yeah, of the aisle. That's what it is. It's neither, if, if people can only jettison the concept of left versus right, uh, those are what I call Titanic deck chair issues. They're rearranging deck chairs in the Titanic. The globalist issues, the global socialism to which we're moving, that's what counts. And those agendas have to go through. That's what you saw when the GATT thing came up. That had to go through regardless of who had voted for what. The other stuff we can argue about. That's sort of the, that's a giveaway. But there are critical structures here that you see dropping in place.